can be refueled in the air, giving them virtually unlimited range. As part of Operation Desert Storm, PSYOPs broadcasts help persuade Iraqi troops to surrender. But Operation Uphold Democracy in Haiti in October 1994 is its biggest success so far. The US military's mission was to back ousted President Jean-Bertrand Aristide in overthrowing the de facto military regime. Commando Solo broadcast messages in Creole. Appeals for calm were interspersed with news panel discussions and local music. Other broadcasts were aimed at stemming refugee flotillas. Messages informed them that they would not be allowed to enter the United States. We were able to turn off the refugees, prepare the country, and to provide an alternative to invasion so that when Aristide did return, it was a peaceful return of a legitimate power. And that is the ultimate goal of uh, psychological operations. We were able to uh, basically win a contingency, I wouldn't call it a war, without firing a shot. But this system does have its limitations. Anyone can turn off the propaganda by turning off their radio or television. The ultimate weapon in the info war would be so secret, so invisible, so undetectable, you would never know your mind was under attack. At Laurentian University in Ontario, Canada, a young student is about to undergo one of the strangest experiences of her life. They're hooking Denise's brain up to an electroencephalograph, or EEG machine. For 30 to 40 minutes, this will monitor her brain waves. While these electric coils attached on either side of her head will immerse her brain in an electromagnetic field. Her brain actually completes the circuit between the two coils. The field pulsing through her brain is less powerful than one given off by a digital clock radio. But acutely controlled and focused at specific parts of the brain, it will open Denise's mind to outside suggestion by this man. I'm going to do a switch to see um, it's right of the chemistry. Use your final temper. Dr. Michael Persinger is a professor of psychology and neuroscience. He is designing ways to put the power of mind control to good use. Dr. Persinger's research focuses on brain trauma. And he uses carefully controlled doses of electromagnetic radiation to induce relaxation and alleviate pain. So uh, what Sandra did was to initiate a opiate releasing pattern. That's a burst firing field that um, is stimulated once every four seconds. And that produces relaxation and a very pleasant sensation. Uh, similarly, using the appropriate field, we can induce fear and apprehension. But clearly, that would be unethical in that setting. Dr. Persinger's tests suggest that carefully programmed electromagnetic frequencies can tap into individual brains and influence people's emotions. The cognitive processes of the human brain are really quite simple. And if you understand how they work, you can make entire populations think and decide uh, the manner in which you wish. Suppose you generate a field that produces fear, fundamental fear in large numbers of people. And then, over the television, more traditional ways, you say, the reason we're having this fear is because of this particular group. And now you start to move the population believing in a direction that you wish. To influence 250 million people, the equivalent of the entire population of the United States, may not be that difficult. According to Dr. Persinger, we already have the technology, satellites and television, and radio transmitters. Mind control may already be happening. We know the mysterious PSYOPs plane can beam persuasive sounds and pictures into people's television sets. Will it someday beam disturbing frequencies directly into the mind? Mind control will be the ultimate non-lethal weapon. Smart military technologies and non-lethal weapons could at least prevent the awful carnage of large-scale head-to-head combat. What then can we expect of war in the 21st century? Which will frighten us more, the threat of unspeakable destruction from plasma cannons and lasers on high, or the prospect 
of national computer crashes. Paradoxically, the promise of truly bloodless war may come only with the most devastating weapon of all. If the human mind and will become the battleground of the future, war 2020 may be won without so much as a whimper, let alone a bang. Will it ever be possible to read the thoughts and feelings of another human being? Maybe even put ideas into their head to have them do our bidding? Science is finding a way. In a strictly therapeutic context, Dr. Mark George uses magnetic stimulation to treat depression. So if you look at the thumb It's a powerful demonstration that our minds can come under outside influence. It looks very promising now that we can use this by stimulating over the prefrontal cortex to influence mood both in pathologic states like depression or um, even in healthy controls we can subtly cause people to be happier or sadder. The technology was first used to explore how the brain controlled movement but more and more doctors are using magnetic brain stimulation to help lift the spirits of depressive patients but could it be used to plant specific ideas into a person's head what we're doing is we are uh, either heightening or diminishing regional activity in our, in our brains and our brains obviously have mechanisms to regulate moods just as we regulate our heart rate or other things and uh, what we're beginning to do is to be able to use this to understand those regulatory systems and kind of push them one way or another. But what about the possibility of reading people's thoughts? Using brain imaging tools, doctors can observe the brain activity associated with specific thoughts or behaviors. It would be possible to not only read the emotional states, but perhaps to induce the emotional states by turning on or off certain regions. Microwaves and other radio frequencies are known to affect the human body. But could they be responsible for voices in people's heads? These are called electromyographic signals. The signals are picked up by electrodes planted on the skin. Uh, the electrodes basically look like this. They're tiny little pads, much like you have in a doctor's office. So if she said the future out loud, the future, we have the signal that's corresponding to that muscular activity. But with subvocal speech, she doesn't have to move her mouth. She could say that word silently. So if she would say the future silently, here she said the future, but she didn't move her lips. And you can see that there is still the same signal being picked up by the electrodes underneath her throat. Once the electrodes capture the signal, they can be transmitted, as if through a cell phone, to someone with an earpiece receiver. In Chicago, Illinois, a world authority on microwave hearing shows how it could work. I'm hearing a microwave pulse like a click. Now it sounds like a, a chirp with a tone of quality to it. Professor James Lin is hearing sounds that aren't there, but he's not crazy. Pulses of microwave energy are being generated and fired at him from behind. Microwaves can be heard depending on the individual, uh, depending on the hearing acu acuity of the individual. Individuals with uh, fairly normal hearing can hear microwaves at the quite a low level. The energy of the absorbed microwaves causes brain tissue to very slightly heat up and expand, causing a pressure wave to be picked up by the hearing mechanism in the inner ear. Professor Lin is far from hearing voices, but it could be possible to send coded signals to an agent this way. Brain is an electrical organ. Uh, it is uh, susceptible to electrical signals. Since microwave is electrical, therefore, in principle, one could uh, embed or encode information in the microwave signal such that it could be perceived by the brain. So, uh, you, you, people know my background from uh, yesterday's speech, that I, my real specialty is artificial intelligence and robotics and um, redefining what human beings will be in the future.
and a lot of people find this scary. I don't want to be redefined. I, I don't like this idea, something that's beyond my control, the very sense of self uh, is going to be altered. Well, you're actually under a lot of control systems, and you have been since birth. So I was talking a little bit uh, about, um, well, mind control in particular, and something that I worked on, uh, and I'm not proud of, but uh, it's called the voice of God weapon. So there are four different techniques and technologies that can pipe voices into an individual's head. And once you can do that, you can control them using neuro-linguistic programming techniques. Um, you're rewiring their thought processes and brains. Um, and so this gets into what's called offensive information warfare. And they used it, I believe, in the Gulf War uh, to tell the enemy at that time, lay down your guns, this is Allah. And it worked pretty well, because hearing voices which have no direction or sound, you have to assume that it's some spiritual entity. Uh, so it works pretty well. And uh, <clears throat> then, I don't know if I'm going to get into this, but there's something called hyper game theory. How do you, they, they want to see if they can manipulate people to do things that are irrational, but also walk them to their death. And so you can call it a eugenics program even. Um, and they need to sample all cultures, language, uh, throughout the world to define their probability matrices of which tricks, techniques, deception works. Um, that's just what's happening. Now we have uh, which are magnetically activated nanoparticles and sensors. So how do you control a brain? Most people don't believe that. Oh, you can't control me. I, I have my own free will. There's no way you can get to my soul. Well, sorry, that's not true. Um, so these nanoparticles are activated under certain magnetic frequency and will alter the brain patterns and pathways. Uh, recently, my school came out, Harvard came out with uh, what you see here on the right slide is the magnified view of a needle that's injected into the brain and puts the scaffolding over the brain and then it's read that way at a f much finer resolution. So let's talk about a little bit um, um, about deciphering the audio and visual cortex. Uh, so researchers at the University of California, Berkeley, have invented a brain decoder device that's able to work out what you're thinking based on neural activity inside of the brain. Now, they use mostly what's called functional MRIs. Um, but uh, you could use any of these technologies that I've talked about. If you're reading text in a newspaper or book, you hear a voice in your own head. Usually, most people are reading kind of aloud in their own head. Well, they can read that, decipher the words that you were thinking to yourself. So there's uh, another one, uh, University of LA, maybe Stanford University. They are decoding visual images. So they train the person under a functional MRI, that's the standard technique, to look at images and then they record them and then they ask the person to uh, imagine the object. It can also just be imaginary. And the computer will decipher the brain code and so you're looking at a hammer, you're looking at a saw, that's a house, that's a cat. So the technology in the civilian sector is coming along uh, quite quickly. Somebody apparently from NASA leaked this as something they were working on. And telepathy, electronic two-way communications. Well, we have that now. And that's very scary if you don't, if you never experienced it. 
Um, making hum humanity think an alien invasion is about to occur at every major city. Well, we have holograms in the sky. I described that technology. Um, and, you know, they, they talked about other things uh, that might make this come about. But all I'm saying is beware. Yeah, can you elaborate on hyper game theory and so-called walking people to their death? <laughs> okay. Yeah, so hyper game theory came out of a, a professor at Dartmouth, obviously, funded by the Air Force and DARPA and et cetera, all the, all the acronyms. And um, it came from a man that died recently, a brilliant man named John Nash, um, who there was a movie made about him called The Beautiful Mind, and he was a mathematician who won a Nobel Prize. And he created game theory, which is used in economics as well as uh, war theory. Now, it relies on rational players. So you run these simulations. What will China do if we make this move? What is the, the, theory, the game, the, the war game going on? Or you can use it in business, similar, uh, similar process. Hyper game theory is a, a one level above of, a, of that abstraction that you don't know what game they're going to play. So they use it in cyber warfare, uh, mostly. And attackers, you know, hackers, they'll use several different techniques. But the defenses, the administrator, and the virus protection, they don't know what game these hackers are using. So they create a probability matrix over the period of the time of sampling all the different kinds of hacks they get. Now you can apply this to other aspects of life. The way that I was using it is they're trying to, it was called mind hacking. So they're trying to hack a targeted individual and you know the targeted individual will create mental defenses as best as they can. They'll go to their social networks. Trade, well, what do they do? They try to disrupt the social network so you have no family or friends. They, and it's a, a back and forth game that uh, they're trying to find out the maximum probability of death in the example that you use, where you'll commit suicide or, or you're, you'll harm somebody, become a Manchurian candidate or something like that. So it's huge, huge database of probabilities across all the variations of mind. You know, the, the human genome, I think we have, oh, I'm going to get this wrong, so I'm not even going to say it, but a finite in the hundreds of thousands of different genes across our species. Um, and we mapped them out in the Human Gene Project. Well, now it's the Human Mind Project, the Global Brain Project, you know, uh, President Obama just recently funded uh, a whole bunch of scientists to decipher the mind. Well, our previous president, same thing, George Bush, said the same thing. They're trying to decipher every possible thought and uniqueness due to culture and language and, and whatnot. Um, I've got a quick question. Uh, just. Uh to confirm, you said you, you were a little bit embarrassed, ashamed that you'd worked on a project called The Voice of God. Yeah. And to your understanding, it had been used in the Iraq War, but you worked on it. Can you tell us what the name of the project in the military as it was being developed was and how much was spent on it? Oh, no. I, I wasn't interested in budgets right. or, or names. The name but the, the nickname was Voice of God. Um, but it goes under a lot of different names, um, different variations. And so let me talk about some of the technology. Um, it's called the, one is called the microwave hearing effect, which uh, with directed microwaves, uh, this was discovered by a guy named Frey. Uh, well, and they're not totally sure what the mechanism is, but they they hypothesize that the brain expands ever so slightly with this energy, heat energy, that gets conducted to the inner ear. Um, there are several other technologies that use ion cyclotron resonance heating or calcium C2 plus uh, 
as a mechanism of influencing the nervous system. And all the ions have their different resonances under the Earth's magnetic field. And, um, they, and then you can go into the uh, ultrasonic uh, realm where anybody in the beam with one of the ultra, ultrasound waves won't hear anything. It's above human hearing. But where the waves intersect from two different directional sources, all of a sudden that person hears it, and that's called the audio spotlight. So there are a lot of mechanisms to project voices into people's heads. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. Um, I have a question that relates to step three in Project, project Bluebeam. Um, it concerns telepathic um, electronic two-way communication. Um, I wondered if it was possible for um, images um, to be directed into yes. the thoughts and the minds um, for a number of reasons for myself and um, I've Yeah, to in fact, all five senses can be mildly overrided depending on the state. Now, if you're in a sensory deprivation tank, your mind seeks stimulus, you know, hearing, sight temperature, anything. Um, so if you're in that situation, your dreams become your reality. Your brain cannot tell the difference. But in other circumstances, if you stay well stimulated, um, it's difficult to project visual images into the target. But uh, even university professors are working on this. Um, so yes, it's absolutely possible and is being done. And in fact, many people complain about uh, uh, forced dreams or, or something like that, that their dreams are not their own. And, you know, that can be, there are a whole bunch of subconscious ways that can be done as well as stimulating the visual cortex in the right patterns and try to project them into the target, yeah. So, um, who would be projecting these, sorry, who would be, which organization would be projecting these, uh, who's responsible? <laughs> you can't say. <laughs> Okay, um, but it just seems to be very real because I've heard it from more than one source, and it can be. Oh, quite it's quite real because yeah. you're awake; you're not asleep necessarily. Yeah, yeah. and it, and it projects also in the visual workspace, as I mentioned before. So it's like your third eye, and you can see both your, you know, through your retina, as well as this other projection at the same time. Your brain's been rewired, and it's inserting this third eye projection, if you will. Is there any way we can protect against it? No, no, great question. No. Mm -hmm. No, you can dampen the effects uh, through stimulating your senses, like music or uh, that kind of thing. Uh, and that seems to help. Uh, certain drugs can dampen the effects. Um, but uh, no one's found a little device that you can wear around that will block no, the signal. Hat you can wear. No, tinfoil hats, no, they don't work. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'll come down on the stage, actually. Because uh, I think it's probably going to be the last question. Now, uh, now um, Dr. Duncan, you've given us a lot of reason over the last two days to be concerned by the potential for abuse of this technology. Um, at the end of your presentation today, you see you feel quite optimistic about the idea of transhumanism. I mean, maybe you're talking about you know, a perfect world where we can draw perfect circles or whatever. But in my view, um, how is this possible? How is it possible for transhumanism to be a good thing without some almost unimaginable social revolution? And I mean, um, as Max Egan, I don't know if you've seen Max Egan's video about transhumanism. He puts it very right, very succinctly, and he says, um, "How how much how much can we be transhumanized without losing our humanity, especially in where, where we have rulers who have none?" No, I, that's an excellent point, and that, that's why I try to ask more questions than I answer. Is um, you, it has to be a social revolution. I mean, that's that's the only way it, it could be accepted by society. But this is so gradual within our generations that it will become more and more accept, uh, acceptable. So, people walking around with Bluetooth, you know, headsets. 
Well, now we accept that. They look like the Borg. But, and so slowly, this will eventually be rolled in, and we won't give it another thought. When a child is born, we genetically engineer them, you know, with blue eyes or what, whatever. They, <laughs> Some might argue, though, that yeah, it's the not technology we already have, I mean, the technology we already have is sort of cutting us off from each other. I mean, I, I mean I'm guilty here myself. I, I, apart from my family in my hometown and the, peop, the men I live with, I know one person. Uh, but I have thousands of friends online, so maybe... Yeah. So, so is that re just a redefinition of how to be social? Is, what, what is a friend on Facebook? You know, and how often you talk to them? I, you, you can't shake their hand, you can't hug them, you know. I, I don't know, this is something society is going to have to deal with. This is a social revolution. It's occurring right now at a very rapid rate. I call it a cosmic evolutionary event in mankind. Yeah, it could, and also, um, we, we, it seems we do have a malevolent elite in this world. Um, the potential for, uh, the, the potential danger here is enormous. It is, and I think there may be an agenda to depopulate the world. Oh, I think there is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, sleep tight. <laughs> I know. But it's, it's grim stuff, I know. And it's, and it's, it is grim it is, stuff. It is Leave grim, on a happy note. Leave look look at this way. I mean, if people, if people are not talking about this, then it'll be an awful lot worse than the people are talking about it. I mean, that would really scare me if this was going on and people were not talking about it. So, um, so Dr. Robert Duncan, thank you very much for speaking well, to us again. thank you for having me.